Good morning, everybody. I'm Lynn Holte, and I'm the Executive Director of the Victoria Law Foundation, and we are thrilled that you could make it, trains notwithstanding. Um, there'll be a few people arriving late because I'm not sure if you're aware, but apparently there was some catastrophe on the train system this morning. Um, so we're glad you could make it. Um, it is our great pleasure at the Foundation to offer this kind of uh, opportunity for so many in the, in the legal se sector. Uh, through our Better Information workshops. And today I think is a very special moment because we are thrilled to have with us Tom McKendrick from Fairfax, who has, uh, I think, many uh, Walkleys and other plaudits to his name as a, as a producer and as an innovator in the, uh, the new media, if you like, that intersect between uh, print, video, uh, online, uh, platforms of various kinds, and you may well have come across Phoebe's Fall, which was uh, a podcast that Tom was deeply involved with, which surrounded a, a recent case in Melbourne. Some of you would be familiar with, I'm sure. And if you haven't heard Phoebe's Fall, I can thoroughly recommend it. It's an extraordinary piece of work, and uh, it really is a, a fine exemplar of the art of podcasting. But that's not what we're here for today. We're here to make the most of our iPhones, which is, I think, uh, a, a really important dimension for all of us who are uh, in the business of expanding the understanding of what we do, because this is how people get their intel these days, and we certainly know that for our own consumption, so let's turn it into a uh, uh, greater capacity to communicate with the audiences we want to get to as well. So I will take no further time and thank Tom very, very much indeed for coming. I'm sure you'll get a great deal out of it, even if it's only to turn your phone from portrait to landscape, uh, <laughs> but much more besides. Thanks again, Tom. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Um, I'm going to tell you one thing, and then you can all go home, or you can pay attention to the details, okay? So the whole point of this session is to change your mindset in how you use your phone, okay? So I would say that probably 95% of the pictures on my phone are of my kids, or what I had for dinner, blah, blah, blah. If you can get your head around the fact that this camera can make a Hollywood standard movie with the right thought around it, if you can make that shift in your head and put that professionalism into what you, how you use it when you are using it for work purposes, then you're done, okay? That's the point, so you can leave now or we can do a little bit more on that. That's what you have to remember more than anything else. Now, a little, we, we are, I've run this course for over you know, two days or two hours. It can, it's, it's all very sort of scalable. This presentation will be available for you all. Probably the most useful part will be in the, uh, there's lots of links in there to other tutorials, equipment, etc. So there's stuff that we won't have time to go into in much detail in the session, but it's really good for your own reference. Uh, in a course of kind of two halves, and we'll see how we go for time, but we're going to look at um, up to here, we're going to look at all the different elements that make a good shot and lots of tips and tricks as to how you can actually get there and improve what you're doing. So light, sound, extra equipment that you might put around the, the camera. Um, quick break, 10.30-ish, and then we're going to have a practice session. I'm going to get you all to film something, because that's the whole point. We'll have a look at some of them, and we'll publicly shame a few people with their shots, or maybe you'll surprise everyone and yourself. Um, I'm going to do a little bit about editing. That, it, unfortunately, kind of it falls a little bit little bit out of the scope of this session just in terms of how much we have to do but I'm gonna give you a few links and a few bits of guidance as to what you would do next when you're actually editing and compiling something that's longer and more in-depth um, so uh, so I'm the national video editor at Fairfax please um, I'll leave these contact details up and there have been the document as well but I'm always more than happy to answer a question or you know feel free to get in touch whenever you may choose um, <coughs> Fairfax has a Fairfax was one of the first organizations news organizations not just in Australia <coughs> but around the world to really invest heavily in, in online video I've been there for 12 years the first video I produced was 
literally 200 pixels wide because no one had broadband. <laughs> and now we serve out about three quarters of a million video views a day across a team of about 20 people across the country. Um, and in a, like modern news organizations have, it, you don't really look at the different media as particularly rigid or separate entities. So I look after audio, so podcasting, spoken headlines, etc. Video, we have a lot of crossover with our graphics and design team. So it's, it's, they're not silos in any sense in a, in a modern newsroom. Um, right, so I've got lots of little clips and examples to show you because these things can speak a lot better than I can on certain points. The first thing, the first, I guess, section is to, I've got a great video at the end for your own reference which compares an iPhone. I'm going to refer to iPhone as, a put, as opposed to smartphone just because it's easier. A, a video which compares an iPhone to a, um, an Ari Alexa, which is, that's a kind of standard Hollywood movie camera, which start, start about $100,000 and then you add an extra quarter of a million on top of it. It's quite a famous blogger from the US that compares the two. Um, and it's, it's very good and it'll show you a little bit about what the limitations of your phone are. But the point I'm trying to make here is that you're never carrying around a professional video camera. What you have is that phone which is with you day and night, probably too much to be honest. But that's the phone that's always with you. So that's the that and that's all that matters really. And this is a, this is a little example uh, from a few years ago. I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about it um, once you've watched it. Can I just pause that for a second? Because you need driving to driving through the. A $750,000 Lamborghini Aventador was driving through the streets of Chelsea in the UK when a Mazda hatchback pulled out of the side streets, leaving the driver with nowhere to go. After riding up and over the Mazda on two wheels, the carbon fiber bodied Aventador appeared to glance at Nissan before smashing into a parked BMW. The unsuspecting cameraman commented on the speed of the Italian supercar on the quiet street but laid equal blame on the driver of the hatchback, whose car would cost about one thirtieth the price of the Lamborghini. There's little doubt the damage to the Lamborghini would be anything short of six figures. Once you take into account the four cars, think upwards of two. There you go. It's quite nice to see someone smashing their supercar, but um, uh, so the point there is it was actually, that's a, first of all, someone standing on a street. It happens to be quite a, a well-known street in London, which is very long and inhabited by very rich people with too much, not enough experience and too much money. So, but someone standing on the side of the street, they hear the note of the engine, get the phone out, because it might be someone famous, film it, smash. They then subsequently sold that to a news agency, I think it was Reuters in this case, for a five-figure sum. So they made themselves a lovely profit on that. And then that's the kind of thing that gets syndicated all around the world, which is, I mean, it's pretty frivolous stuff in a way, but it makes the point that you have what you have and that, that camera is always there. Uh, and he got, you know, two shots. I believe they were blurred out because they were the sons of a Russian oligarch. So that's why. Now, this the camera that you have in here is, as I said, absolutely remarkable, but there are a lot of pros and cons and limitations. It's important to know your limitations. You've got to think bi as big as you can, but you need to know the limitations of what you can do. On the plus side, that in the right conditions, you get a remarkable picture. And we'll go into the conditions a lot more later on, mainly to do with light. They're small, and, and which means you can carry them, but it's also important to remember that they're inconspicuous, um, which goes a long way in certain situations. Um, and you can instantly send and publish from the, your phone. You can have footage back. I send my producers out and I will almost, in a big news event, I'll almost always have them send something from their phone prior to sending or returning with their professional footage. Um, they can be hard to use. So that is a, what, so what you, when you see a TV camera standing outside the high court and it's on the shoulder of a big burly, grumpy news cameraman, <laughs> as they always are, 
the part of the point, you can get a picture of infinitely better quality from a very small camera than compared to that. Part of the point is that it sits on the shoulder and it's completely steady and that you can move around and you can do what you need. There's other ergonomic things as well, but um, having a small camera is a lot harder to keep steady and to interact with and all that stuff. Uh, all of the kind of the fundamentals of, of video production are can be hard. So sound, focus, exposure. If you want to do anything that's more creative and get things spot on, it can be tricky. But there's lots of tips to get you along the way. Um, <clears throat> if you are in a situation where you want to transmit something quickly, you might not need to. I mean, that, some of this is based more around kind of news coverage. You, you might not be in that situation as regularly. But video files are very large, and it's, it takes a lot longer to transmit them than um, still images. And it will, so your network connection may be a problem. Phones will generally, unless you use a specific app, if you email something, for example, it will almost always compress the file in some way, we'll either make it physically smaller or, or reduce the quality of it in some other way. So that's to, to bear in mind as well. Uh, and battery life. So um, video processing is really, really intensive on the battery. You'll, if you're filming for any length of time, you'll, battery life will go down. The camera will get very hot as well because it's working incredibly hard to do what it needs to do. Um, in situations, a time lapse, for example, which a phone's really good at, if, if you were doing something of a long duration, you'd, you'd, you would ideally have a power supply plugged in because it's going to chew through the battery very quickly. Um, phones also get, as they get older, they deteriorate, as you all know. Surprise, surprise, after two years, your phone starts to die and you need to buy a new one. So, and it's normally the battery that's one of the big issues there. Um, that, uh, that's actually slightly incorrect now, but just as a, some of this, I don't, uh, avoid getting into too much technical detail because it's not necessary, although it's there for your reference, but a modern iPhone can film at 4K, so Ultra HD, so, which still is pretty mind-blowing when you actually think about it. Most um, professional video cameras, and most so TV news, for example, they would never shoot in 4K, which is twice the resolution of a high-definition image. Um, there, it's not the the numbers are not the only kind of metric of how good a camera is and how many megapixels, blah blah blah. It's not really all about that, but having the ability to film at that massive resolution is very impressive. It also means that in an, when you're editing, if you, it's, it's a slightly hard to sort of represent here, but if you imagine you've got, let's say that's your TV screen, the, the phone is filming at double the size of the screen, which means that you can, you can crop in and out of this much larger image to do what you want to do. So if I was, I, we often do this with bigger cameras, but say I'm filming an interview with you, I'm filming it twice the size that I actually need. So I can have a very nice wide shot of the whole room and I can also have a nice close-up of you, same quality, using a single camera, if that makes sense, yeah? Um, I, that's, a, I mean, that's a huge sensor. When we talk about a fast lens, it means it's, a, um, it's, it's very good at letting in a lot of light. You can also, for those of who have a bit of a photographic background, you can actually create a depth of field in a shot as well. The phone can do it artificially, but you can do it um, in reality as well, which is where you have a, something in focus and a very really blurred background. You, I'm sure you're familiar with that. Um, the slow-mo, I'm going to show you another clip in a second. This function, on that's been on the iPhone since probably version 6 or thereabouts. So a, a, a TV broadcast in Australia runs at 25 frames per second. So it's 25 still images per second, um, 30 in the US. So with at filming at 240 frames a second, so that you, you up the frame rate to create a slow-mo effect. Essentially what it means is you can play back your footage <coughs> at about, um, uh, you can speed it up by uh, a factor of 10, essentially. So it's playing at one-tenth the speed completely seamlessly. So <coughs> as of even two or three years ago, you would have to hire a specific slow-mo camera for a job, something like a cricket or a, a motorsport, high-speed stuff. 
for a, a matter of many thousands of dollars per day. I'm not saying this phone can do everything and it doesn't have a zoom lens, etc. But that, I promise me, promise you that that's a remarkable feature and one to experiment with. We'll get into it a little bit more later. Time lapse is brilliant as well. Works incredibly well, um, and it, it, in conjunction with image stabilization, which is it's because it's it's very obvious that a phone is small and wobbles around. The phone does a hell of a lot that you don't even really notice to keep itself steady as you're moving around. Um, oh yeah, so a couple of things. So um, I brought this one up. Th this is actually from a few years ago now, and it's it's interesting in its own right and also as, a, as an example of how things progress or how quickly they progress. So this is a, um, an American photojournalist called Ben Lowy who shot a front cover of a Time magazine on an iPhone. And he, there was a lot of sort of miscommunication up to the point of publication about how, on what camera he used to take the shot. And there was uproar in the sort of photojournalistic community about the fact that it was an iPhone and it's time and this is just sacrilege. Uh, the point is, it's a brilliant shot. And today, you, wouldn't, you would never even get that argument at all. We, I mean, we, in the age we publish iPhone images, you'd probably find one in the paper every day. Um, uh, the other point about this one is he's, he's a really interesting sort of pioneer of digital photography slash video. The point I made about the phone being inconspicuous, that's actually quite an important thing to bear in mind as well. Um, he, he's a generally a, a war correspondent. So he's in areas of conflict, areas of cultural sensitivity, um, and almost exclusively uses an, a, an iPhone for everything he does. And this, it's not, it's about inconspicuous in the sense that you're not, you don't draw attention, therefore danger to yourself. It's small, it's portable. It's also culturally, it's a much, much less invasive thing to have in front of someone who's not used to the process for whatever reason. Um, it's also a lot more um, <coughs> a classic thing that you do when you have interview someone on camera. You will talk to them prior to the shoot, b before the equipment comes out the box, and they're brilliant and they're very communicative and they know exactly what they want to say. Big camera comes out, lights go on, and they completely freeze, and you get nothing from them. Having a small camera, which is the ideal, and we'll again more on this in a, in a minute, but you can be filming someone, even on a stand or holding whatever, but you've still got line of sight. They're looking at a human being. They're very used to the fact that an iPhone, they have one themselves, so there's no, there's none of the, all those barriers get removed really quickly. It's a big advantage. Um, thinking about the kind of things you might produce if it's it, it, it's all about the individual but say it's a, a client who's a good case study for example they're a bit uncomfortable it's going to be perfect for that for that kind of thing um, oh right this is just a little bit of example of slow-mo could watch a whole documentary at West Indies cricket, which would be quite nice, but very short shot, obviously. So that's the point about putting a professional environment around a camera. So this was, we produced this a few years ago now. Um, needed a slow-mo shot, needed a really sort of nice motif for a series of stories about the Cricket World Cup. Did not, clearly didn't have the budget for a slow-mo camera and a whole proper setup. So that is two, so it's two spotlights, so a very sort of harsh, bright piece of light on, on $30 worth of turf from Bunnings. Put that in our video studio at, at, um, on Spencer Street. And fortunately had another producer who was a good cricket player. So it took a while and we nearly broke a couple of phones, but eventually, and a little, there's a little bit of dust on the ground to make it sort of puff up, but that's, that's done on iPhone. And it, all it is is with a bit of extra thought around around the shot, just a little bit of extra planning. Um, it's quite a good fun day that was. Uh, okay. How long did it take to get that right? <laughs> uh, it was at least half a day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that particular one, oh we did, probably, we published three different versions of it. There's one that comes sideways and one 
the hardest part was probably actually getting the ball to pitch up properly. Um, people, cricket players, often complain when they watch that because, well, the grass is too long. There's, you wouldn't get as much sort of sand as it as it as it jumps up. But that, I mean, I'm not a cricket player, so I didn't notice that. But um, yeah, it was about half of the yeah. It's mainly getting the ball right, getting the lighting right. Um, part of that is that as two reasonably strong spotlights, the point is that you completely blacken out the rest of the shot, so everything's focused and exposed for that really small little spot, so the ball kind of appears from nowhere and bounces and disappears. So, um, Do you think that rotating the lens allows something in the room? Yeah, like yeah so it's complete, that, that's a good point, because that was another hard part of actually bowling a cricket <laughs> ball when you're not. There's, there's a few trips and falls. Um, uh, okay, uh, just as a last one on, on a, this is an updated one, which if you, this is a current um, campaign that Apple are running. It's based around same-sex marriage debate. You could get into our own debate of whether how a multinational takes advantage of these sort of social issues, but if you just look at it as a, so this is all shot on iPhone with lots of extra work afterwards, but it's a, it's a pretty good example. They do, they do this kind of stuff very well. Don't ask me what you know is true. Don't have to tell you. I love your precious heart. backing to do this kind of thing and you would you would imagine on a production like that it's they, they produced another one it's a slightly older link now which was the maybe the 30th anniversary of the foundation of Apple as a company and they got a and they a very fancy all shot on iPhone but the behind the scenes of that production and of this as well which I think I've got a link to it's a it's an iPhone so some of the shots are on an iPhone but they're on a you know, on a full steady cam setup or a, a crane, you, if you've seen a Hollywood production, so a, literally a crane from the windows to here with massive weights and lights and blah, 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 and then they've got an iPhone on the end of it. So it's, it's kind of at the extreme of what we're talking about here. But it, it's the same point, it's just taken to the, to the extreme. Um, all right, so uh, now, this is the second most important lesson. It's very juvenile, but it makes a point much better than I can, so we'll just watch some of it. <coughs> this video didn't have to look this way. It could have been prevented. Say no to vertical videos. Vertical videos happen when you hold your camera the wrong way. Your video will end up looking like crap. <laughs> There are more and more people addicted to making vertical videos every day. It's not crack or nothing, but it's still really bad. There are two different kinds of people who are afflicted with VBS. The first group treats the videos they shoot like pictures. They don't mean any harm. They just don't understand that while you can turn a picture, you can't really turn a video. The other group is people who don't give a <laughs> Vertical video syndrome is dangerous. Motion pictures have always been horizontal. Televisions are horizontal. Computer screens are horizontal. People's eyes are horizontal. <laughs> we aren't built to watch vertical videos. I love vertical video! Nobody cares about you! 
Get the point. Yeah? <laughs> Hold the phone that way. So again, it's about having a TV screen and an image that sits like that. It's a classic, certainly in news, a lot of, certainly breaking news events, things that happen around the state or around Melbourne, we publish a lot of content that's harvested from social media because that's where people are and that's the whole crowd idea. And it's invariably it comes in like that because that's what people naturally do when they you know, do this. There's ways around it, of course, but it's it's very frustrating. So you turn it around. Having said that, I'm going to throw in a slight caveat in that there are when you're producing any kind of video, you have to think about the end point and where it's going to be seen and by whom and how it's published, etc. If you generally that's going to be on your own websites and platforms, etc. If you're on social platforms, most, most prominently on Facebook, it's actually, you, it's actually, you can start to think about different ratios and sizes of, and shapes of video. So Facebook as a news feed is, is vertical. Um, so we at The Age, for example, we'll use, we do a lot of kind of teasers and promotional stuff from our, for our bigger pieces of journalism. And they are often actually produced either vertically or square, for example. So it take, it's, it's a nicer format when people look at it on their phone, as in when they're you know, maybe commuting or whatever. <coughs> um, and it takes up a much larger real estate on someone's newsfeed as well, which means that they're going to, they have more, t as you're scrolling through, they have more time to pay attention to it and to become interested in it. So it throws up lots of different challenges in how, and it, it, will, it has to inform how you actually film in the first place. But let's say you've got a, a campaign coming up. It's all going to be on your social platforms. You could quite conceivably film everything like that. So you know, it's, one that, it's a decision that you have to make pretty early on and something that you have to, you're, you're, you're stuck with it once you've decided on that, but worth bearing in mind. Um, of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Older yeah. <laughs> um, it's it it does depend a bit on how you publish it and where they'll see it. So if you if you think the majority of the exposure it's going to get is on social media, then yes, you you probably consider that. If it's going to be, I mean, if it's going to be published on YouTube, if it's going to be embedded in your own website, which is a slightly more traditional publication then I would recommend that you stay horizontal. Um, there, I mean, it's, the latest iterations of smartphones are, at, they're at a size, physical size now, that a lot of people do watch video, so a horizontal video with the phone held vertically, because they're, they're comfortable with the size of, of how that plays, especially when it's perhaps in the middle of a text article. So it's a, you know, it's a sort of evolving discussion, really. Um, a few years ago, definitely, I would recommend that. But you know, you have to bear in mind that you're, depending on what your, where your audience is seeing this stuff, it might well be that you go purely vertical. You know. Um, so we've done horizontal, generally, unless you choose to 
to do otherwise. A few other just tips, and this is stuff to bear in mind because we have a practice this after our break. So a big problem, as we said, is, is in keeping a camera steady. The phone does a good job of helping you do that. It, it will, it will, it kind of has its own image. It's like a, almost like a suspension system around the image sensor, so it can handle bumps and jumps <coughs> only to a point. Um, what you really want to do is add a little bit more to keep the camera as steady as possible. So worst case is when you are somewhere where you've got nothing around you to brace yourself against. And this is an old photographic technique, but the simplest way to do it is to just tie your elbows to your rib cage like that. And suddenly you'll find you take a lot of pressure off of your shoulder muscles um, and it's, you're using yourself almost like a lamppost, like you're resting against your own body. It makes a very big difference. Um, try to not, well, try to not not breathe, if that makes sense. <laughs> so someone uh, years ago told me about, who was a very um, advanced yoga teacher who also filmed a lot of stuff, it's abdominal breathing, right? So it's, it's a, you're getting a bit deep here, but if, you, if you're doing this kind of thing and you're a bit nervous and then the camera's going to move, if you can try and, you know, you're calming yourself down, you're breathing from your stomach, things like that, they, they seem a bit peripheral, but they'll make a huge difference because what might seem like a small movement there is magnified 10 times when you actually look back at the, at the picture. Um, I'll go, I've got various bits of equipment here, I'll go into some of them later, but you have, uh, sorry, first of all, I, uh, if you've got anything around you that you can lean against, just the sort of, you know, it's actually quite a nice shot when you're, say you've got a person here and you've got a big long wall or a fence or a background and you can lean against the wall and you're suddenly a lot, a lot steadier. And uh, that could be a car or a lamppost or whatever, whatever is around you. Um, you can get, and I would, there are two or three things if you, as you develop and do this more, there's two or three very, um, affordable things that I would recommend to make your life easier. This setup is called, these are called Gorilla Grips. It's a tripod, but it's also, it grips onto wherever you might want to put it. So you could, you could just brace it against there. You could put it, say there was a fence post or something, it can hold itself sideways, or it can just be a, a table stand. Like that, or about, you can go down to any camera shop downstairs and get one for about $20. Sure, excellent. Uh, then you have a million different kinds of clips to hold your phone. So suddenly you've got, you've freed yourself up, you're, we're looking the other way, you'd be looking at your shot, obviously. Um, you can do what you need to do to have that human interaction, but you've still got this in your line of sight and you know what's going on and you're happy. It's, you'd probably use that on, be good on a table where you're at a, a similar height to the person or somewhere that's a little bit higher, etc. Really good for a time lapse and other stuff as well. So that whole setup's I don't know, thirty dollars. Um, I, I did bring one of these, the dreaded selfie stick. <laughs> it's not. I mean, it, I, I think most people despise them in a certain way, but there are. It's just another example of something that you can use. It's got the similar kind of spring-loaded bracket, so it holds any kind of phone. Um, that could be, you know, to get a high shot or just as a, it, they're actually quite good for things like a, a walking shot. Um, so you've got the cameras kind of stabilizing itself and you can move around. Really good for things. Th moving shots, are, you have to be a bit careful of them um, in some environments, but something like a, what would be uh, something that's very static, like a building. Say you're doing a profile of a new office that you're moving into. Actually injecting a bit of movement through the shot can work really well. So actually you see that in sort of real estate videos and stuff regularly. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna, our practice is gonna be a very short little vox pop kind of interview because I'm making a bit of an assumption that you, you, the stuff you do will probably have people in it. Um, <coughs> so again, using the sort of the advantage of the camera being small, I'm going to get into some sort of shot composition in, in a minute, but um, let's say I'm interviewing you. So I want to have eye contact. I want to be able to ask questions and, and make you feel at ease. If you can get into a position that's roughly like that, so you've got, I've got elbows against the ribs, so it's a bit steadier. I'm doing my yogic breathing. 
Um, um, I've got this in my peripheral vision, so I know that it's recording, I know that the shot looks good, it's not moving around, but I've also got line of sight there. It's actually, it's so much easier to do that with an iPhone than with a professional camera as well. There's just so much more in the way. <coughs> uh, it's also, I think it's fair to say that people are much more relaxed when they're speaking to another human as opposed to a, a lens. Um, it's a good thing to bear in mind as well when you're, you can do all of this technical stuff, but it's irrelevant if the person on camera is nervous, not talking, doesn't want to be there, etc. Um, so making them at ease is really important. Uh, that, that, and that, this flows on from that, which is just to be regularly checking your shot. You should, I always try and get my producers, like, there's a, there's a sweet spot between being too nervous and anxious about something that you're doing filming live, but having just enough sort of adrenaline, I suppose, to be switched on and to be constantly monitoring what you're doing. It's another point about just adding a bit of professionalism really is that you should, you don't just hit record and forget about it. You should never do that. Even in a, the most boring four hour speech that you might be filming, you should always be checking what's going on. Is the battery okay? Is the focus okay? You should be regularly doing what you're doing. I think you're gonna check this camera <laughs> at the back there. Um, uh, has the lighting changed? Has anything uh, in the sort of sound environment changed, etc. You should always be, always be doing that. Um, there's a, it's, you'll find this, it's, it's a little bit mind-blowing in a way when you're doing all of this by yourself because there are so many different things going on that cre create a good shot. So you've got, you know, like, so changing light, um, a steady camera, sound as in technically is the cable connected and is a, has a bus just driven past or whatever it might be. Um, is the person comfortable? Are we running out of time? There's a million different things going on. Um, which you have to think about all at the same time. <laughs> it's very hard filming by yourself. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, I suppose it's a good point to remember. If you've got an extra person there that can do one other task, it'll make your life a lot easier straight away. It could be someone that's just monitoring the camera or they're keep making sure the door's closed so no one walks in and ruins your shots. Stuff like that is invaluable. Um, all right, sound. So, it's... Again, we're t talking about um, people talking. It's, you, you, you should really consider sound as important, if not more important, than the vision. Because it could be the most beautiful shot in the world, but if you can't hear what they're saying, then they'll switch off immediately. Um, this is a, one of the most common ones. It's game over straight away. That's the most common, one of the most common problems you ever have, which is just wind on the microphone. Um, I'll show you a bit more about this in a second. But when you see, you know, a fluffy, as we would call them, or dead cat. So on a on a professional microphone, you've got a big fluffy cover. That's getting rid of wind noise. So it's taking the energy of the wind and dissipating it before it hits the microphone. And you can get ones that are very long, and they do an incredible job or one of those big cages that you might see, called them a Zeppelin, which is where the microphone is behind a very thick kind of gauze that stops all the wind coming in. So that's, that's the point of them. Uh, I guess I'm telling you that in part because there's ways you can improvise and, and make things a bit easier for yourself. Um, uh, let's go on to the next one and then I'll... Okay, so on, on sound, uh, of paramount importance, um, Ideally, you would want to record a few seconds and play it back to yourself before you actually start the proper recording. So you want the, a, a disadvantage of a phone is that you can't, you generally, you can't really be monitoring and listening to what you're recording as well as recording it at the same time. Um, and when, when we talk about e extra microphones and stuff, uh, microphones are, all of this equipment is very fallible and it might be that the batteries run out or the cables a bit rusty and you get a hum or a scratchiness or whatever it would, might be. So you really, if you can just do five seconds, play it back to yourself, <coughs> very important. Um, given the limitations of what you've got, let's say it's just the phone, you need, so the phone is brilliant at, as a kind of, at getting the best case scenario out of what it sees and hears, but it's got its limits. 
one of which is that um, it needs it will lock onto the strongest source of noise, but it will also try and accommodate everything else that's going on. So it doesn't really if there's a kettle boiling and you're talking, it's not going to be able to differentiate, and it, it will try and give you some of that and some of you and some of everything else. So the more you can do in terms of proximity to get to force it to know that your voice is the only thing that matters, and the simplest thing is just be closer. So one of the reasons the lens is, is quite a wide angle lens on a phone, um, one of the reasons for that is that it's set up so that you, you're actually in, in any kind of video or portrait, about a meter to a meter and a half is roughly where you want to be, and that's sort of determined by the lens as much as anything else. And the advantage is that by being closer, you're going to pick up the sound much more easily of what someone's saying. Um, the microphone is in the bottom of, a, of an iPhone, which is actually a bit hard when you're doing video because it's, I'm filming you, but the microphone's pointing sideways. It's a, what you call an omnidirectional microphone, so it, it's looking for sound in 360 degrees, but if, you were, if I was pointing that just as a voice recording directly at you, it's going to be even clearer. Um, You've got to get away from any look at it. Whenever you film anywhere, you have to think about the location and everything that's going on in it. Uh, and not just right now, but what might happen. So is it about to be lunchtime and there's going to be a million people coming through? And so any kind of background noise is really important here. Um, traffic's unpredictable and really very hard work normally. Wind is a huge problem. Um, even things like, so I had a, a, a shoot many years ago, uh, some kind of press conference, and it was a room like this, but the air conditioner was just there next to the lectern, and there was lots of TV crews, so we all had a microphone set up along the, along the surface, and every kind of 15 seconds we all got this horrible distortion in the microphones, which was <coughs> that, the air conditioner just cycling up and down, blowing against the thing, and we had to stop, it was Paul Keating, so, and who's a grumpy, excuse me, but we had to stop the, the, the whole event and everyone had to, we had to switch it off, uh, put wind socks on and do all that stuff. So it's stuff that, you, and again, if you're not listening to it, you wouldn't actually know. So um, worst case, if you've got, let's say, you have to film someone right there, right then, and there's a big bus um, right behind them. Let's say they're standing there, bus with its diesel engine rumbling away. The best and simplest thing you can do is turn around. So get them, get your, your body between the source of the noise and their voice. So you're shielding that um, source of noise. That works to a certain extent for wind as well, using yourself to just shelter what's going on. Um, what else? Uh, other little things before we get into equipment, it's probably, it goes for sound as well as wind, but if you know, remembering where, or how your, your camera's laid out, so microphone's in here, even just as simple as, so let's say, winds coming from behind me is nothing to do about it. Just by cupping your hand against that microphone, it's going to give it a bit of protection as you film like that. It actually, it's a, as by way of demonstration, if you were playing something back, whatever sound source back, and you hold your hand like that, you're kind of channeling all the noise in one direction, which works works pretty well. I did once use a uh, spare sock, foot sock, on the end of the phone. I had to get atmosphere noise and the other camera was in a different car, so it's a, a clean sock, of course, over the end of the phone on a windy day, and it worked an absolute treat. It slightly reduces the volume, but great. Um, as I say, a bit more equipment a little bit later, but it, when you take things beyond just the phone, there's other things you can do. And the, the best one, and the one that you will probably already have with you, is a pair of headphones with a microphone in them. And this works an absolute treat. So, microphone, this is, you know, you're doing telephone calls, etc. So the microphone is, is in the volume control, as you may or may not know. Um, what I've seen many people do is actually get the, can you just hold that? Or you, you may get, depending on what they're wearing, you can tuck it into just a little button or something. I could interview you. That microphone is now right to as a professional setup, you want a microphone right in the middle of the chest plate. You get really nice resonance from someone's voice, and it's it's right there um, where the sound is originating from. I can film you talk away.
everyone's happy. It's actually, um, well, let's just hold it like that. Luke, so, um, don't touch the actual microphone. You could, you mean you can conceivably question and answer like that. It's, it's incredibly good. These are, I mean, it's great to have a microphone. These, I mean, everything about this setup is, is really good. The headphones are great. Too. Just a question with sound. Do, do you ever have opportunities like straight sticks, things where you just happen to be able to pick up on sound that's around, like a really great busker, for example? Or, yeah. Is that ever? Does that happen? Or? Yeah. Do you mean? Stuff that we publish at Fairfax, or just yeah, or generally, <coughs> you know, if there's good sound that's happening out there. Mm. Perhaps, yeah, sure. yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and it's in podcasts are quite a good example right. in that environment because so in, in any uh, in any kind of documentary work, you would always record a couple of minutes of Atmos in any location that you're in, and that can be for other kind of editing reasons. But yes, if there's someone singing, or it's a bird, or a tram, yeah. yeah definitely. And it's, again, the phone's really good at that kind of stuff, which is more, more kind of general noise, because it's looking around the whole, the whole environment. Um, uh, so, what I'm going to do is skip forward. I'm no, not too far. Go back to the equipment. Um, okay, light. So, one of the big limitations of any cheaper camera, not just a phone, is the way that it handles low light, darker situations. The more expensive cameras have them. One of the big advantages is what's called a bigger dynamic range, which means that they can represent a much wider spectrum of dark to light than a phone camera. And you'll see it most often in, in uh, the shadows of a shot, they can become quite kind of speckly, you don't get much um, these are all, none of these are actually shot on an iPhone, but they're examples of what, what you might try and replicate in a simpler way. So, <coughs> classic, um, what we call three-point lighting, uh, when you're lighting a subject. Some of these only have two, but you have um, a main light, which is called a key light, which hits this side of the face, the face is the side that's going into the shot. You have a fill light, there isn't actually... Uh, that one's a little bit better, and it just reduces some of the shadows. And then in video, if anyone manages to do this in our sessions, they are mightily impressed because, especially so in video, what we call a hair light or back light, which is a little spotlight that sits just up here, and it gives just it defines the subject from the background really, really nicely. Now you could do that with a little flashlight or whatever other source of light. It could be, it could even be a fluoro potentially. But if you can get a little bit of a kind of ring around someone's head, it's, it will just make your shot look. It will just really stand out so much better. Um, yeah, so that so normally you have three three lights, spotlight, and two big kind of floodlights uh, on a subject. What you bearing that in mind and not having that equipment, you need to think about how could you fudge that, how can you replicate that. So. The overlying kind of principle is get as much light as you possibly can into your shot. So even in here, if I was filming one of you, the floors are pretty horrible as a source of light. They're quite unflattering. But even with this amount of light, you've got to remember that your the human eye is way more sensitive than a camera or a beat. So in here it's actually not that great. So I'm looking over there, for example, into the kitchen area, that's many times brighter. There's natural light in there, there's daylight in there. You'd immediately think about going somewhere else, just a few steps away to make it a bit better. Um, bring reflections are actually a really nice thing. In the CBD, actually, whether you're based here or not, but if you wander around sort of middle of the day, there are all these just remarkable pools of light that are bouncing off some of the skyscrapers glass front of buildings and you'll see if you're paying attention you'll see these sort of pools of kind of blue or coloured light which are reflecting off the buildings it gives you a different look but that reflected light is absolutely beautiful it's really strong but it's not nearly as harsh as full sunlight um, it's just about I guess what I'm trying to say is it's, you, you've got to really kind of interrogate your surroundings and find what you can um, you can bring this is again 
in want of another source of light. Let's say you're outdoors, um, bright sun, loads of shadows on the outside of the face. These things, the reflectors, which you've probably seen, will bounce that light from the sun back up onto, for example, the other side of someone's face. I'm not saying you need to buy one of these necessarily, but you could use, you could genuinely use a piece of A4 paper, and that will actually reflect quite a bit of light back. Um, these can also be used as a sunshade as well, um, on, the, on the white side. Um, yeah, windows are obvious. Uh, things like candles, it's a little bit tenuous, but um, the other one to bear in mind is the light on your phone. Uh, if, you, if you haven't discovered that, I can show you individually, but that flashlight on your phone, it's actually reasonably bright when, it's, when you're in a dark room. It will also, you can force it to remain switched on while you're recording as well. So again, if you're quite close, that could be all that you need. It's a little bit harsh, but it's much better than just darkness. Um, so again, a couple of examples of that. As I say, these are not filmed on iPhone, but there's reasons for showing you them anyway. So that's all using available light. So there's that fed square at night time. Uh, this side of the face was fairly soft light from an advertising boarding. This was, there's a little bit coming from the screen at Fed Square, but there's also a, my sound recordist had the light from his phone hitting the side of this guy's face as well. Um, it's, you would hope for something a bit more in a, in a professional environment, but it's actually pretty good, seeing as you're actually, all you're using is two phones. Uh, depends a little bit on how close you get with the torch, etc. So this is just a series of three shots on, on the, uh, on, um, it's kind of about sun, but ultimately about putting the person at ease. So bearing in mind what, all of what I've said, this, 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 that sort of trumps everything. So story about the Yara, he's an expert, but there's some pieces on the river. We were hoping to get the river in the background. Uh, it's midday, it's summer, and that's very, very bright on his, uh, on the left side of his face. I then put a reflector in, which you can see the advantage of the reflector in that it, it gets rid of the shadows, and he cracked shit straight away, because it was two, it's basically having two suns right in your face, and it was very hot and very unpleasant, which is totally fair enough. So all it did was got, the journalist was over to the right, got him round to the left, sacrificed the, the river, as a background, and suddenly starts smiling, and he gave an amazing interview. Uh, and then we just afterwards we had lots of other footage of the river. So that the the shot, the lighting is probably not quite as nice, but it's him that ultimately matters with that. Yeah, so what you to the tank if you think it was out your head, because I know they were pretty shy, but it would stop the whole. Yeah, it's, hats and sunglasses are a bit of a nightmare. I know. Yeah. Um, Again, it, it would ultimately come down to how comfortable someone is. You know, if they take off the sunnies and they're just, they just can't do it. But yeah, it's really hard, especially because apart from anything else, so where ideally your subject is a lot brighter than the background because it makes them stand out. If they've got full shade over their face, this is just going to look horrible. It's going to be too bright. And, yeah. I think in that situation, you probably just move into the shade. Um, that's just another example of natural light. Um, uh, nice dark background. Um, the, there's other stuff about the composition of it, which you, as you get a bit more creative, but it's kind of there's a bit of a um, vanishing point there, and there's kind of diagonals and stuff. But he was just sitting at the end of a row of um, shade, so he's nicely lit. Just a cloudy day, nothing else on dark backgrounds so you would focus on, on him. Uh, 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 Alright, I'll, I'll get through some of this a little bit. These, there's a couple of things here which you can um, sort of take in at your leisure, but um, so keep it bright. Outside is better in terms of uh, daylight. Um, so to make your life easy, shoot outside on a, on a still cloudy day. So still so there's no wind cloudy because you don't create shadows, but it's still lovely, bright, soft, very generous light which will make people look good. Um, never shoot 
something backlit. Does that make sense to you? So your subject needs to be brighter than the background. If you put someone in front of a window, you've got the opposite of that, and they're going to look like a silhouette. Look for any source of light, apart from probably fluoros. Um, <coughs> and then this function here, and I kind of need to show you this for people that haven't used it on their phone before, but phones have a great, almost all phones do, function where you, it will automatically look after everything, exposure, etc., for you. If you want to manipulate that up and down, you can tap on a, an area of the shop and tell the camera to focus and expose specifically for that piece of the shop. Um, and you can actually also go up, slide that up and down to make it brighter or darker. A um, good example might be something like, if you were shooting a silhouette, not that probably a person, but uh, you, you know, I suppose you could actually take it to that conclusion where someone wants to be anonymous. You can have them behind a really bright setting. You can just dial it down so that they are completely black. Background is just how it should be, and suddenly you've got anonymity. <coughs> uh, Alright, we'll get through this and a couple of other quick bits, and then we'll break, and then we'll have a practice, and then come back and do a couple of other things. So, the venerable ex Prime Minister who was very drunk during this filming, um, <laughs> he felt wonderful. But, um, so, this is the idea of composition, so again, based around people which is going to be kind of your bread and butter. Has anyone heard of the rule of thir thirds? It's something that you can actually bring up as a grid on your phone, but it's a, it's a old artistic technique where you want to try and get the, the point of interest in any shop to be where one of these lines converges or lying along a line. So in this case, the bridge of the nose is very much the centre of the head, and he's, he's talking, so we're trying to place him exactly on that spot. Um, if it's a landscape, you might look at something like that. So instead of having the horizon right in the middle, you've got a huge big sky. He looks a lot smaller in that shot. Um, those waves were not actually that huge, those at Bells Beach, but it gives a bit more drama to the, to the environment. You could, I mean, you could potentially have the waves up here as well. Um, and he's also, he's not directly up in the cross, but he's, he's not central in the shop, so it gives that real sort of perspective. Um, <coughs> that would be how to avoid doing it. So we set him up like this. He's talking into the space that you're creating in the shop. Um, this, the reason why you were trying to avoid this is that that third of the shot is basically redundant. There's kind of nothing going on there at all. Um, so, just in a bit more detail, uh, to either, in either third of the shot, depending on where they're looking, and if in this, if you imagine with a camera, you have a journalist or yourself talking directly to that person, they're looking into the frame of the shot, so into the space. Um, the eye line is level with the camera, which means you don't, don't be too low or too high because it's going to make them look odd in different ways. And then in terms of the sort of framing, you, that you would normally, when someone's talking, you normally aim for a mid shot, so some, which is, you know, middle of the page to just above the head. Don't chop off the head, but don't give them this huge big space at the top because it makes them look kind of hiding in the shot. Um, there is the other, I guess the other, bigger reason for some of this stuff is that when in a classical two-way conversation in an edit, the reporter or the whoever the other person is would appear in the opposite side of the shop. So when you're editing between them, they're taking up opposite sides of the shop as opposed to just appearing in the space where the, the other person is. Um, yeah, so that's what just said. Um, we'll go through, so this is where we've got lots of links and other stuff to, which you can look at at your leisure, but there are lots of bits of equipment that you can use to add a bit more pizzazz to what you're doing. So iPhone headphones are excellent and you probably have them with you. Um, this company, Rode, they're an Australian audio company, they 
are excellent, and they kind of they kind of mimic German and Japanese technology, but they're incredibly good and much more affordable. Um, this one. Uh, so this is the, they're by far the best option for you guys if you if you're looking to spend a little bit. These ones are about sixty or seventy dollars. Um, so it's a lapel mic, um, which is perfect for not just for interviews, but you could easily use it for a bit of atmosphere, etc. It's got a little clip, which means that you're not, you're not touching the microphone, so it's not there. as much noise. It has a foam wind cover, which does a, a certain amount of good. Um, and it's made specifically for a smartphone. It comes with its own app, but you can just use it in your, no, in your normal camera uh, setup as well. Um, it also works the incredibly frustrating thing that Apple do where they change the connectors. So in the more recent iPhones with the lightning connector, that adapter will still work and still do what we need. I've got, as I say, I've got a few bits and pieces here which I'll, I want be keen to get your hands on when we have a practice. So that, I keep one of those in my bag wherever I go, and I rarely use, but sometimes it gets you a hell of a lot of trouble. Uh, the other one, new point about atmosphere and recording, this one here is, that's, that's, a, that's a dual stereo microphone, and it's more, you could, use, you could use that for something like a podcast where you've got people sitting around in a circle. Uh, atmosphere is really good for, um, you can also, direct those, they, they both um, pivot, so you have them both pointing in one direction and they'll cut out all the sound in the background, which is really quite nice as well. And that one's $100 or thereabouts. Um, there are lots that go up and up from there. Um, it depends on what you, how you're recording, what your budget is, etc. This one's it's a Sennheiser, it's a German company, which is kind of at the very higher end. It's specifically for um, iPhone and it has a lightning connector, but they're about $300, so bear that in mind. Um, but nonetheless, it's really good. Uh, you can, as I say, there are other things that you can do with your phone. So you can get these kind of fluffies, they're not specifically made for iPhone, but you get short, short range ones, which you can, this one wouldn't quite fit, but you can do this kind of thing. Um, or use a sock. Uh, you can also, and this one, I've only got one of these, but another experiment. So, <clears throat> professional microphones have any kind of professional microphone. This is a sh fairly short shotgun microphone, is how we describe it. You normally use one that's a bit longer. The point of these is that they, the longer they are, they, they eliminate much more of the sound in the whole sphere. So this kind of one, it, it will concentrate on about 20 degrees of noise in the whole 360. The longer ones will do even more to cut things out. So really good in noisy situations, uh, such as on the stream or something. So you can, you can be a little bit further away, of course you can, but it's going to work much harder to cut out all that noise. Again, they're, they, they get expensive pretty quickly. Um, so professional microphones only have this kind of connection, which is called an XLR, um, which just gives a much cleaner signal. But again, you can work backwards and put with a certain kind of cable, which links for as well. That, that will adapt itself so that it can then be fitted back into it. So this one's all ready to go and will work with the with the phone. And you will, you will. It's interesting because some to the untrained ear, you might not notice an enormous difference, but if you put it through its paces, noisy environment, maybe a very loud voice or whatever, you can you will start to tell. It's, I suppose one of the reasons for showing you that is that some people, it's amazing what people find in their cupboards at work from various iterations of trying to be innovative. And there might be bits and bobs lying around that you can adapt and actually use with the phone, which will help you out. Uh, <laughs> just to take it to its extreme, you can, you've probably seen these kind of lens adapters and kits. You can, this is a genuine one, ludicrous, but that's a, so that's a Canon professional stills lens with an adapter that fits onto an iPhone. So it's pretty, I mean, it's pretty ridiculous in a way, but it, it, in professional image gathering, it's, um, it, 
ultimately it's the lens that is going to get you the best picture. Hard, it's hard to enforce that on an iPhone, but the, the, the lens is absolutely a central point of a professional camera. So, you know, I, I've never used one of them, and it, it's, it's only as strong as all the other links in the chain, but, you know, never know. A lot of photographers do have a setup where they will have their main SLR and then on a bracket where the flash would normally go, they'll have an iPhone on there and they're doing, certainly news photographers will be sending bits and pieces from the iPhone or they'll be shooting video with the phone and stills with the camera or various different setups like that. Um, it's interesting watching news photographers, they're very um, they're incredibly kind of innovative and practical and stuff. Uh, and then the, these kind of lens kits can be quite good. You can get much more wide angle lenses, you can get longer lenses, so zoom lenses. Um, if you so choose, if you maybe, uh, if you have a kind of photographic background and you want to sort of put some of that rigor onto your shots, it can be good. Um, so, we're probably, we're going okay for time, but we'll time for some questions, then we have a break, come back and we'll do practice. Any questions? Wow. Spoke about uh, touching on a particular area of the phone so you can focus on that yeah, area. Yeah. How and then so the square comes up with the little sun. Yeah. How then do you uh, manipulate the the brightness or darkness in the place? I'll do what I can to show you up here. I'll show you individually as yeah, well. Thank but, you. Um, so that's quite a good example because it's a very bright yep. um, subject. Let's say I want to keep it. So I'm tapping on that as the brightest part of the shot. You get the square box, uh, as you described. You can then <coughs> um, you can roll your finger right. up and down, which will. So let's say I take it a little bit darker than I than it will do by itself. So what a big advantage in this situation. Let's say you were. Um, of course, they can't show you all of this, but you could. You've got that locked as the. Sh the exposure that you want, but this is all a little bit darker. But say you're planning to pan around, you may want to do something like that where you know that the end point of the shot is how you want it, and you just kind of sacrifice a bit of the start. Uh, it's, it's, I suppose it's, it can actually be a bit more, well, I would probably use it more in still photography. Um, it's great for things like, for example, a sunset or a silhouette. Phone will try and do a bit too much, whereas a, like a proper silhouette, for example, it's normally the camera will normally not. It, it's a bit of a kind of middle ground. You're really a proper silhouette the subject should be completely blank. Yeah. You normally take it down a bit before you do that. Okay. Thank you. So that's good. Yeah. Um, with taking video, did, before you're talking about live um, live video, is there any pros and cons with live streaming and that when you're doing it? Like, is that is that common or is it what a because um, it's live, there can be a lot of issues that happen at the time you're yeah. streaming it. Is that something you recommend, or is that something uh, you'd be cautious uh, about? No, you've, I suppose you just have to be very aware of, of the technical issues and the potentially legal issues as well. So um, there's no going back once you do something like that live. So, uh, so for example, we do quite a lot of Facebook lives, and do a lot of AFL, for example. Probably not on an iPhone, but a camera that is Wi-Fi compatible. But we would be very careful of. There would be a lot of testing before we go live. We'd be moderating scripting and other stuff so that not, nothing goes out accidentally. Um, uh, the live stuff as well. You need to have enough. You need to go for a long enough period of time for people to actually notice it and pay attention. Uh, which often requires a bit of kind of pre-promotion. So if you've got say a big event coming up, a couple of months time, if you're letting people know prior to it, they, then they can build a bit of interest there. Uh, and they are, uh, certainly Facebook is an example, that it's, as soon as you stop recording, it'll process itself and then it's available on demand. So it's available on the property after that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> you said before when you're emailing, you often lose compressors. Yeah. Is there a particular app or program you use to share files? Yes, uh, yeah, I'll, I've got a, a couple of links on that. Um, uh, so you've got different tiers, you've got you can email or transmit in whichever WhatsApp or however you might want to do it. 
you've got apps which will not compress it, but obviously take a lot longer to send. Again, some of that's predicated on how immediately you want to get things back to base, if you like. Um, and you can obviously publish straight from your phone too. <coughs> but if you're doing any kind of editing, the ideal is that you plug the phone into the computer and transmit. So there's kind of tiers there. But yeah, there are apps where you can you can leave it completely undepressed, or you can do a small, a certain amount of compression just to handle stuff. But to bear in mind that so at 4K, so at full resolution, video files are about 170, 180 megabytes per minute, which to send on a 4G connection is quite substantial. So, um, Android is pretty much the same, I've been playing with my Samsung, where it's been Yeah, yeah uh, pretty much, yeah. They, I mean, they, I don't know, everyone steals everyone else's technology, there's not, there's, there's idiosyncrasies to it, but pretty much the same. Yeah. Yeah. And can you reduce the video quality if, you know, better quality in the shoe weeks, um, how large the device is in terms of your phone capacity, like, yeah. how long can you record for a uh, it's, a, it's a bit, it's, they, I don't think they would ever publish a figure on that. It's like the top speed of a car, like it can, yeah. if you've got a brand new phone and it's fully powered, it would go for it. Conceivably go for the full battery life. Mm -hmm. But I would be very surprised if it did, it would probably just overheat. And the phone, the phone's overheat and you probably had it, it'll just shut down straight away. Because otherwise it'll just melt or go on fire. So. And unfortunately, if you're recording any kind of video, if you, if, um, if you're recording and there's an issue with the camera, it shuts down, drop it or whatever, it doesn't finish the file, and you lose it. So that's, um, there are very expensive things you can do to save some of the file that is absolutely crucial. But yeah, it's trouble. You want to be doing things in short bursts. Really. Are there times that you can tell the camera to record at a lower level? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, uh, yeah, if you were recording something that's very long, do that. You can do that in the settings. It's actually slightly different there because you don't record while you're broadcasting. Yeah, yeah. Just do the live broadcast on Facebook. Yeah. Once it's finished, yeah. Facebook will generate a video right. which it holds there. Yeah. You can download that, yeah. but it won't exist on your phone, which is actually kind of an advantage. Does that make sense? Yeah. Just a question about the use of drones because we're seeing it more and more. Is that still something that's really specialised? and should be outsourced or are people starting to do it themselves? Uh, I'm really wary about putting it my phone to a drone, but... Yeah, uh, you wouldn't really want to... Drones will almost always come with a, their own camera. Right. It's all about... The, you've got your blades and then what's called a yeah. gimbal, which is the suspension. Yeah. Uh, uh, I've just had a very uh, complicated process using a drone a couple of months ago, so it's in front of my mind. But, um, you wouldn't really want to attach a third-party camera. But, uh, on the other point, you need to go through a few hoops. Basically, you go to the CASA, which is the Aviation Authority website. You get a, a license number, which is like an ABN. And then, most importantly, you CASA have their own app, which is incredibly good and as a sort of safety device. So, wherever you are, you switch on, it will locate you on the map and gives you every overlay in terms of safety. So your X almost from an airport, you can't go above a certain ceiling of height, blah blah blah. So and if you stick to all of that then you're okay. But if you break the rules, such as the guy that tried to buy a sausage from Bunnings, <laughs> you got in a lot of trouble. <laughs> National parks, things like that, are, are no low areas, lots of military facilities and you don't you might not know they're there, so you've got to be very careful. Just it's, it's like the classic of ultra common sense. And they can break incredibly too. Um, should we take maybe a ten minute break? About past eleven. Quick chat and then we're gonna stand up and Okay, so we'll get to a couple of minutes. Just as a as a bit of housekeeping, we, we were nominally gonna finish at eleven thirty. 
I'm happy to stay until 12, but it depends. Does anyone need to be out of here in a particular time? We probably need about that much time because once you move around and do a bit of filming. Um, so I'm going to get you to, bearing in mind everything that you've just learned, you're going to split into pairs or threes, however it works out. I'm going to stick very closely to that deadline. In fact, 10 minutes if possible. Um, all I want is one quick interview slash box pop. And that's why you're in pairs, so you can swap and take turns. What you talk about is irrelevant. Just what did you have for breakfast? Why were the trains delayed? Whatever it might be. The important part is the person that's filming and what they get. So think about where's the light? Where's the so sources of other sound? Um, how comfortable is the person? How steady is the shot? All those things that we've been through. You've got, you're welcome to use any of these bits and pieces here um, uh, as, as you wish, and you can share them around. I've also got, I didn't bring this up, a couple, this is another um, remarkable bit of technology, which is if you're talking about lights beyond, you could, something like a flashlight can actually be okay, even with a bit of um, gauze or tissue on the front of it, it can actually look really nice. These lights are a good example of the sort of sub $100 range. So LEDs, USB, rechargeable. They have a, they're dialable in their intensity, so they can get really bright. I, I use these almost exclusively for that backlight, but as a front light, they're incredible. Uh, they have different um, filters on them to change the color of the light and the intensity and stuff, so have a play with them as well. Um, to be honest, something like you know the light on a push bike, like that as a source of light. If you do it properly, it's great. Shoot that. Shoot one or two pieces of what we would call overlay or B-roll. So you generally, uh, if something's unplanned in its production, you film, what did you have for breakfast? You had croissants and Vegemite. So film a shot of the kitchen or a shot of a plate or something like that that's relevant to what the person has said. Um, and then, now, different phones, different connections and stuff, it can be a little bit tricky, but as much as possible, I want you to send it, to email it directly to me. Now, I'll, I'll wander around and individually help you out if that's a problem, and don't worry if you don't all do it, but we'll ideally look back at a few pieces uh, at the end of the session, and then I'll promise to del delete them, if you want. Um, so I'll leave that up. So you've got back here by 11.30. Probably stay in the building just to save time. You can be in here, you can be out there, anywhere in the kitchen area, um, but that's actually part of the challenge. It's gonna be quite noisy, okay? Happy? Clock, clock's ticking. Right, carry on sending if you are still doing so. Good. Publicly shame a few people now, but so we'll have a look at a few. Apologies if we don't get through all of them. Um, for 10 minutes. Um, a little bit at the end about editing beyond just trimming your clips. As I said, it's not, it sort of extends beyond the scope of this class, but a couple of really good links and things that you can do once you go beyond just that single shot. I think what you realise here is that you, you get to, you, you've got all the basics of the shot, but what you will pro all probably want to do quite quickly is actually compile and edit a, se a sequence in various different ways. So we'll get to that. Um, So, as I said, I won't, I won't kind of get hands-on and demonstrating stuff, but there are, it's, I think, I used to advise people to, to try wherever possible to edit on a laptop or desktop machine, mainly because of the physical size of the phone, but they're now at a point where you've got enough, you've got enough space, and much better on an iPad, but you've got enough space to actually do what you need to do on the phone if you want. iMovie for iPhone has not really any reason to go any further than that. It's free, it's, it's a native Apple app, so it's always going to work really well. Um, and you can do a lot of stuff. Um, I've got a few, just a few screen grabs here. It will, you can film 
from the app, you can use the, using the camera that's coming straight into the app, or you can access your library and bring in whatever you want. You can bring in stills, video, music, it'll go to your iTunes library straight away. You can record a voiceover, you can add <coughs> transitions, you can add text, um, you can obviously trim clips, you can do all of the basics of an edit. All the way to the point of pushing it out, so exporting it. You can, you can you can be logged into your social accounts and publish it directly from there. Um, all that stuff. Uh, iMovie. It's just the mobile version of it. So, if you have an iPhone. Yeah. So, if you have a so, Samsung or a smartphone. So, for Android, I, I mean, I don't have first hand experience. The Action Director is supposed to be a really good one. The, there's a, there's things like TechCrunch and kind of tech sites, all those the Virgin main sort of reputable tech sites are constantly reviewing this kind of stuff, so it's a good, good place to start. Um, as a third party one for, for Apple, and I think for Android as well, is Video Shop, which is really good. So it's only, I mean, only $2, and it does a few other functions. Um, and then Premiere, so I've got a little bit of a, oh, sorry, I'll just show you the screen grabs again, so it was, ah, what's that theme music? change, uh, you can do things with slow-mo in terms of how slow or fast it plays, and, uh, that one at the end is a voiceover, that's just some text, um, it's, it's incredibly good, as I say, but if you're doing that more heavily, you, you would find it would be more pleasant on an iPad, because there's more room, but perfectly acceptable on the phone as well. Um, uh, I don't think so. No. That's, it's a good point, actually, because so when I, I teach in TAFE from time to time, and, you, and I try and get the student, one of the first things I do is try and get the students to, I get them a shot list of just a dozen shots, we should to deliberately stuff up in one way or another. So one that's wobbly, one that's out of focus, one that's blah, blah, blah. And then you come back, and I'll then get them to try and fix those problems in post-production. Uh, and it's a, it's a good lesson because there's some things that you can do a hell of a lot to fix, like wobble in a shop, in a professional system, you can fix it a lot. Colour, it's out of whack, you can do amazing things. Wind and the focus are the two things that are pretty much stuff. Focus, you can to kind of tweak things a little bit, but uh, very common mistakes and really hard to fix. Um, then I've put this one into so the premium, so the the I'll skip four uh, for for desktop, and this takes it to another tier, obviously. But if, as you as and when you are more regularly producing video, uh, there's not much of an argument to go past Premiere Pro, which is Adobe's video editing software. So Adobe make Photoshop, After Effects, Illustrator, and other stuff for web. So. Uh, uh, until five years ago, four years ago, Final Cut Pro was very, very popular and really good, uh, which was an Apple-only system. It's now called Final Cut X, and it's you know, pretty ugly. Uh, so, and Premiere's taken up all of that ground, and it's, it is it's remarkably good. It used to be terrible until about until we saw that opportunity and put a vast amount of resources in it. It's incredibly good. Yeah. So Premiere Pro is what I use, but everybody should use After Effects. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? So After Effects is for animation, and I would there is it's a, it's mind-bogglingly big and complicated, and there's a crossover, and it frustrates me all the time at work because people want to get into After Effects and really jazz up their videos, but there there's a, at least a sort of twenty percent crossover of things that you want to do you can do in Premiere, no problem. So much more fancy. Positing of text and stuff, it's all, it's all there as well. Do you have a tip for title? Is the best title after after uh, market title? I would, unless you want to do something really yeah. wizzy, which you, depending on the subject matter, I would stick with what you've got in there. To be honest. Yeah, and there are templates, and there's also free templates, motion graphic templates that you can use. Which you can pull. Yeah, but it's just okay. bring out the files. It's okay. really easy. Um, uh, so this is Adobe's. Pricing is, is all uh, licensed as opposed to a purchase of software. The single license for Premiere is $30 a month. 
I think they have an educational slash non-profit price as well, from memory. Um, you can pay a lot more for the entire suite, so you get every program that you need. Um, they also have a mobile version called Premier Clip. If you have, and that's free, but if you have the license, you can do lots more and you can transfer projects and all this kind of stuff, so it integrates really nicely. Um, that, the, the learning curve on any big piece of software is pretty steep and you have to really, um, you kind of have to bite the bullet a bit and just sit with it for a few days and get your head around it. But as soon as you hit a certain spot, you just take off and you can do anything and everything you want. And this is used everywhere, it's used throughout Hollywood. And the TV, the TV networks tend to use basically more kind of clunky systems because of various historical reasons. but. Um, Anyone and everyone will be using that. So there are free pieces of software around. There are things that do a certain amount of what you want, and that might be all you need. But if you want to go to desktop and do something proper and regular, that, that's absolutely the way to go. In terms of the learning curve, so yeah. if you are to tell like work how much time I'd need to sit down and learn something like that, yeah. you said a couple of days. Uh, if you spent the uh, uh, YouTube clips and stuff. Yeah, so you, they, yeah, it's all out there. Adobe have their own training stuff out there for like Adobe TV. Um, so yeah, if you like, if you lock yourself in a room for two days, you can get up to you would get to a point where you would then have to just start working. Like, and that's where you're really going to learn is when you're on real life stuff. But yeah, absolutely. It's, um, I brought that, that screen's a little bit unfair because there's a lot of stuff like that. So that's a color correction. This is very advanced sort of filter, well not filtering, but uh, yeah, color correction and other stuff. Uh, you would basically be looking at this where your files are, this is a way to view them visually, and then this is what we call a timeline, which is just where you're compositing things <coughs> over time. So it's, it, you can use any of these programs in a really, really advanced way or in a really simple way. And they're built to be kind of scalable in that way. So yeah, if you, if you were of the right mind and motivated to so you can, a couple of days you can get pretty close. For memory, you can also you can access trial versions of the software as well. You know, one month trial just to get your head around it and see, just make an assessment of how comfortable you are and if you think it's worthwhile. Um, so it does, you can get more advanced, you can fix all of those problems, you can do incredible things to um, enhance your footage. You can, it handles multiple formats of footage really well, so different from different devices all in one place. So you've got something from YouTube, something from a phone, something from a, a, a still image. It's all just bundled, bundled, <coughs> bundled in and really happy. Um, and I guess you will, but you, you always, you will reach the limitations of anything. You, if you're really regularly producing, you'll reach the limitations of the phone reasonably quickly. But it's all, it's, yeah, it's all about. Um, much you want to get into it. I'll just, uh, uh, these, won't play these at the moment because we're nearly out of time. These are just a few examples of other bits and pieces that have been done using the old iPhone. To be honest, some of them are a bit promotional. Steven Soderbergh's it's a little sort of weird Soderbergh movie all on iPhone, and it's, it's just by demonstration. Uh, he loses a kid's bike in a river, and then it all gets pretty loose after that. But, um, this is the one that's a comparison between those two cameras. Um, Professional Alexa and an iPhone. He's a really, really funny, geeky kind of blogger. But it's, it's five minutes. It's really, really good to, to see the difference in the shots. There's things that the phone does well, but there's things that the professional camera just blows out of water, obviously, because it's $100,000. Um, these are really short instructional videos from Apple about kind of how to get, so it's all thematic, like how to shoot a silhouette, how to shoot action, stuff like that. They're really good too. And then this one, I only saw it because Carl Sagan, this wonderful American scientist, but he narrates this thing, another thing that Apple did, which is again, all on iPhone. Yeah. Yeah. So we can do any kind of titling and captioning. Uh, subtitles as well, it's worth bearing in mind. Is you got broadcasters and publishers are actually having obligation to it's pretty hit and miss. We've struggled to do it in the past, but YouTube has a very powerful subtitle tool. You upload it 